I want to talk about getting rich in a recession. If you don't know, recessions, generally speaking, last between 12 and 18 months, where expansions can go from 8 to 12 years. Now, I've been doing this for 22, 23 years. I've bought in every cycle, but I wanted to be very clear. My life-changing wealth, the best deals I've ever done, the home run of home runs were done in recessions. And if you've been following my channel for any length of time, you know that we were getting prepared all the way back in 2019 when we thought we would have a recession. So I've been licking my chops. I want to talk about getting rich in a recession. I want to do this with the one and only Jonathan Plumley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Michael. Good to see you this week. When we thought maybe it wasn't going to happen because of my internet issues, but here I am. So it's it's good to be on the show. Yeah, good karma. The audience loves it when we talk about uh, you know syndication, apartments, and, and getting rich. So I thought I would talk to you. You you like me thought there was something around 2019. It was coming. We were headed that way, and then obviously the pandemic, you know, threw over the apple cart. Uh, but now it it's it does feel like one is is coming, right? They yeah. are natural, and they're typically short, right? Certainly shorter than expansion. So, I thought I would just ask you: How are you planning? You know, where are you looking? What are things are you doing to get ready to take advantage of the recession? Well, I guess you know. I'll be honest and say there's nothing specific that I've been doing that's related to getting rich during a recession. It's just that all the stuff I've been doing all along is going to be really useful <laughs> during the, this, this recession. You know what I mean? So yeah, of all, all of yep. all of the years of building, you know, a list of investors, you know, being present on social media, doing show, you know, this show, my show, things like that, that all is very helpful for now when uh, it's, uh, you know, time to take advantage of these things that come up. So, yeah. you know, so how is this going to affect me personally? Well, so what this means is that I, I'm in a position now because of the investors I've cultivated and the other, you know, people who can, that I can partner with that I've cultivated over the years that if I find a really spectacular deal out of all the carnage, I'll be able to take advantage of it, right? And and the um, you know, unlike the last time when I wasn't in the business during the crash, I did come in right after the crash, so there were still a lot of good deals around. But um, it it was you know I was already hearing stories in 2011 about like you know people telling me it was too late, right? That I missed all the good deals. <laughs> from 20 from 2009 and it's probably true i mean people were buying apartments for seven thousand dollars a unit you know in in 2009 because the banks were just trying to get rid of them i don't think that will yeah. happen again but i think but i think there's i mean multifamily yeah. is, is on sale right now yeah probably... when i when i think about recessions and and i loved how you answered that question because that's the right way to go you don't you don't get ready in a recession yeah. Because again, when you think about the duration, a recession, let's call it a year, it takes a lot more than a year to get ready. So what really, what what you shared is perfect is, Michael, I've, I've been doing this for, you know, four or five, 10, you know, whatever years to get ready for it, right? You've been building relationships. You've still been doing deals. You've been exiting deals. You've been returning capital. You've been educating. You've been highlight. And also one thing you didn't talk about is you never stopped underwriting. Yeah. Even when deals didn't make sense, you never stopped underwriting and you looked for value and looked for opportunity. You did that so well that you actually pivoted out of multifamily into what I'll call bo boutique hotels, for lack of a better yeah. term, because that's where the value was. And you're you're always seeking value and, and you never – that's that's a big deal, man. You, you can't get ready in a recession. You're either yeah. ready when it comes or you're not. And so – we're ready. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, but but listen, I, I will I, I'll I will just sort of caveat that by letting because I don't want people to feel like oh, it's too late they're going to miss it and then they're just going to like tune out and not yeah, take yeah. advantage. So I, I do what I would like to point out is that a lot of people are more ready than they think they are, right? Mm, tell tell so, me. So yeah, so let's give an example. Let's say that you are a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Just to pick an example. 
Sure. You're already high, surra- high income earner, right? Yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. You're yeah. already surrounded by other high income people who very likely want to invest in real estate. You've just never had these conversations with them. So you have the network already built. You just haven't ever uh, sort of primed the network or like, you know, taking advantage of the fact that you have this network, right? It's very difficult if you're, say, a kid fresh out of college and you're trying to build a network of of investors that, you know, that that's going to take you some time. You may not uh, be able to do it in time. But if you're if you're already like in a profession of whatever kind, you have the network already built. You just have to start talking about this with your colleagues and telling them, hey, I'm, you know, I think the time is going to be right to pick up some really good real estate deals, you know, and start having conversations with people. That's what you need to be doing to prepare before the opportunity strikes. Because if if it's going to be a little bit harder, like if you find a great deal and then the first time that these people are hearing from you about this great deal that you have and you want them to invest, it's going to be much harder. But if you've been kind of like drip, 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 like telling them right. about your adventures in real estate and how you're like, you know, you you think it's really going to be a good time to get into it. And and you and it'll give you that time to have those conversations with people who um, who think that, oh, well, the market's crashing, so it's a bad time. I should wait. Right. To have that conversation with those people about like, hey, no, this is actually the best time to get into the market because this is when, you know, because we know what's going to happen. The market is going to bottom out and then it's going to start heading back up again. And if you wait till it heads back up again, you're going to miss the best opportunities. So this point where everybody is feeling scared and anxious about the real estate market really is the time to be starting to like look for deals. And it's happening. I mean, I'm starting now to see that first trickle of like, people posting on social media about the deal they bought off of, you know, from out of foreclosure or the the short sale that they were able to buy, right? It's starting to happen. The the floodgates have not yet opened, but the the that dam is like there's pinhole leaks in oh, that yeah. dam. And, you know, so it, it is really the time to start to 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 talk to the, your colleagues about this. I couldn't agree more. I mean, again, part of this whole process of getting ready and talk about getting rich in the recession is is I'm trying to motivate people to start now. It's yeah. certainly not too late now. And you're absolutely right. Um, I've raised millions of dollars over the years, a couple of different times. Uh, one time when we paid uh, 10 or 12% interest just to be the first position debt. And another time I brought them in is still debt, but I gave them 6% plus 20% of the upside because my my hold time was different. One time was long-term hold, bought stupid low. The other time was, hey, I'm going to be in and out in 100 days because they were flipped. So again, you can get creative. You can find you know, what's what's important to your, your friends by having those conversations. And document, doc, the journey is what people want to see. Like if you, if you just pull up your friends and go, hey, I found this 100-unit deal, blah, 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 and you haven't had that conversation, you should be expected to be ignored. Yeah. But if you talk about, hey, I'm looking and, you know, I've been looking for, you know, 77 days in a row and I've done, you know, 50 underwriting and this one, this one is the best I have seen. That probably gets their attention. Yeah. And you can, you can start having deeper conversations. Yeah. And, yep. and you don't, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But, no. And you don't need to do a hundred units, right? I mean, I've been oh, writing I, about I, this. Yeah. 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 I've, I've been posting. Uh, the reason I just want to flag this is because I, I've been posting on LinkedIn if you guys are not following me on LinkedIn, please, you know, come follow me and connect with me. But the, the, um, yeah, I've been, I've been posting recently about the sort of pushing back on this idea that like, oh, you have to do a hundred units, your first ah, yeah. deal, do a big deal because the work is the same, wh- whatever. Like you really have to get started where you can get started and don't get hung up on things like, oh, I should do a bigger deal. Cause frankly, it. doing a bigger deal is really hard. It, it it is more work. I mean, it's it's a lot more psychological work, but it's more work mm-hmm. to raise the money for. Like you could need oh, a yeah. lot more investors. Like there is more work involved. It's a lie to say, oh, it's the same amount of work. So um get started on a fourplex if that's where you can start. Like if you're absolutely if you're a you know, whatever, whatever your 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 profession is. I mean, it doesn't have to be a doctor. It doesn't even you don't have to be highly affluent. As long as you have a network of people that that trust you. You know, you guys can go in together as partners in a in a fourplex, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's this is this is how you get started. This is how many many very wealthy people in real estate have gotten started. Is just with something small. 
they do one, then they do another, then they do another. Before they know it, they've got 10 units. Now they can do a cash out refi and now they can buy something bigger. I mean, it's how yeah. you got started. Absolutely. So it's, it's just don't get hung up on like these numbers or yeah, these vanity totally stuff that people post on social media. It's it's BS. Like just start. I love that. Just start. The other thing I don't know if you're seeing, but Ken McElroy is painting a pretty clear vision of what he sees coming in the next couple of years in multifamily. And I'll do my best to to parrot what I've I've watched and heard. Uh, I'll sh- go watch Ken McElroy for for kind of his takes on. It. He's talking about this a lot, but basically he's like, yeah, you know what? The next two years are going to be painful. There, there's going to be blood in the streets. Uh, but do yourself a favor, get ready, and buy because there are good. There are going to be some great deals, and they, it will go by fast. And then the follow up to his thought is, hey guys, look at 2027. There's no building going on. So yes, we have a lot of inventory coming. We've got some bad debt and some some people who need to bust out. It, it, it will be rough, but if you if you look up just over the horizon, we're not building anything. So again, Ken's like, yeah, the next two years are going to be rough, maybe flat rent growth, maybe down a little bit, but you know, look up, and uh, it's going to get good again. And and Ken says that as somebody who did the last crisis, and the same thing happened, right? building was going gangbusters and then it crashed and he's like well guess what happened for 10 years after that so yeah i i think i think ken ken's idea it makes a lot of sense to me what do you think yeah i i think that makes a ton of sense i mean it's it's really the typical kind of real estate cycle right which is where it, everybody starts building like crazy because they can get the debt and then the market gets into an overbuilt situation the debt dries up you're right. Nobody will lend anymore. And then the whole thing starts again. And you won't start, the banks won't start lending again until the market mm-hmm. reaches a new equilibrium. But then, you know, if you think about how long it'll it be late. To build. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so even if the market, so let's just say that all the excess uh, inventory in some of these markets is absorbed by the end of next year. Right. Dude, even say it's 26. I mean, right. So well, be it. But yeah. even let, let's say it's early. Let's say it's all okay. absorbed by the end of 2025. All right. It's only at that point that the banks will start to lend again. Oh, right? I got you. So, which means that nothing is going to hit the market oh, for, for at least years. two years for at least two yeah. years after that. Exactly. Right. So yeah. now obviously there's gonna be it's not like nothing will get built because there are going to be things built here and there. There'll be local banks. It'll be, yeah. you know, it's always very, it's always very granular and market specific. Right. Correct. So, but just as a broad proposition and when Ken McElroy says nothing is going to get built, I mean, what he really means is the, the, yeah, the amount, the amount trend, of construction yeah. is going to, is going to drop a lot, but that Correct. doesn't mean nothing is going to get built. But Valid. It, very true. Yeah. And that was but, my word that maybe he didn't use nothing. That was maybe my yeah, but well, I mean, listen, it's 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 a figure of speech, right? I mean, a lot right. of people, a lot of people are saying very similar things because that's just okay. the way the cycle works. Mm. That being said, there are markets that are not going to go through this as well, True. right? True. There are markets like the Midwest where nothing, not nothing, you know, over overusing this word, nothing, you know, very not. There was not as much construction in the Midwest as there was in the Sun Belt. Correct. Because because of kind of like the herd mentality aspect of, of real estate. And so those markets right now are the ones that are experiencing rent growth they, and they don't have a huge pipeline of supply coming forward. Right. So those markets are performing well already. Right. There's yeah. right right this minute you can go and and buy deals that are that are working and you don't have that uh that cash uh sorry, the cash flow problem or the you know the occupancy problems that a lot of other markets are experiencing right now. However, what what is interesting is that, you know, the banks in those markets too are also skittish, right? Meaning that it's harder to get the debt and it's, uh, which means there's going to be less competition, right? So if you are able to get the debt and get the equity together, you'll be able to find good deals. Yeah. When I think about what's coming over the next couple of years, and you know, there's this general notion of distressed real estate. I, I don't think people really understand. I see there's three levels of distressed real estate investing. There's obviously the traditional, you know, slumlord property hasn't been maintained. All the you know, all the cash flow has been sucked out. 
Then there's distressed debt, meaning that you know we're going to see a lot of that in commercial where the debt resets the the debts actually the liability. But then there's also kind of the seller. The seller could be in a bad position. Maybe there's other assets he has that are um, you know going bad. So uh, it looks like we've lost Jonathan. He was having some internet uh, issues, so I'll just keep uh, just talking to see if he comes back. But when I think about getting rich in this next recession, I really want people to realize there's kind of those three things to pull on. We don't only need to be do doing driving for dollars and looking for you know ugly properties. We also should be networking with banks, community banks, figuring out um, where the issues are and also sellers, right? One of the things that, that I want people to know is I am open to overpaying for the right multifamily property, you know, five to 40 units. And what do I mean by that? My intention is to hold these properties long-term. I'm going to let Jonathan in and, and see how we're doing. I think he's coming back. How you doing, Jonathan? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. So my internet, internet went out again, so I'm on my phone now. Oh, there you go. Well, uh, it's okay. I've been, I've been kind of riffing on a topic, hoping you would come back in. I want to share with you an idea um, yeah. just to get your feedback. I... I'm excited to do my biggest units, you know, uh, up to a 40, maybe 50 unit building in this cycle, like right? 10, 20, all those. And I want, I'm actually putting it out there, Jonathan, that I will overpay for one of okay. these properties. And let me explain. My intention with these building is, is I'm not going to flip it. I'm not going to extract value. I'm not going to, you know, do any of that. So my time horizon is forever. That's point one. When I say I will overpay. Point two is I'm not an idiot. I certainly will overpay on value, but I'm going to get terms that allow me to hold the building forever. So yeah. I will look, be looking for below market interest rates, you know, maybe a, a balloon out at 10 years with no payments, whatever it is. And the reason this is important is if you if you find the right seller who's ready to get out, you can structure a, a crazy win-win opportunity. Yeah. Right. You can structure. You could, you could give them, like, let's say the building's worth a million bucks. I'll pay 1.2, but we'll do a 1-1 one, one loan at some really low interest rate. He gets a little payment. He or she gets a little payment. Then, oh, by the way, you know they pass on. That note then becomes an asset to the family. They get they get their basis raised, and you know bingo, bingo. Uh, so there's lot, lot, lots of ways you can do this. So, again, I, I wanted to get your idea. I'm putting it out there. I want a message. I'm telling all the California brokers I'm willing to overpay for some multifamily in the Central Valley. It's got to make sense. I got to be able to hold it forever. Um, we're going to get at least a large portion of seller financing, either a first or a second, because the numbers got to make sense. I got to be able to hold it forever. Yeah. What do you think of all that? So yeah, I think I I think that um, when you're investing for your own account as opposed to doing a syndication, you have a different your needs are different, yep. right? And you have some more flexibility, right? So for one thing, you have ultimate flexibility on the timing because you don't need to return capital to your investors. Correct, yes. So you can true. hold it You can hold it forever and you can really take advantage of the fact that real estate is your friend. So mm -hmm. you can look at, I mean, sorry, time is your friend, right? So you can really look at this in terms of the question you can ask yourself is, you know, not, well, what kind of return can I generate in five years when I have to sell this? But, you know, 20 years from now, am I going to be happy I bought this property at this price, mm -hmm. right? And if you feel that, well, yeah, I'm going to be happy that I got this property for 1.2, even though like, yeah, if I had really, you know, right. wheedled the guy down, I could have got it for 1.1. Like, will it matter 20 years from now when it's worth $3 million? No, you will not care. No, I will care. And the, the really the whole idea of this, and let's use that example one, two, like I'm willing to write you know, two offers, right? There's a cash number. And in this, this case, let's say it's 800 grand and the building's worth a million just to kind of play this out, right? Yeah. So the building as it sits worth a million, you want all your money today, Mr. Seller, not a lot of buyers out there, not a lot of stuff. I'll give you 800 or 750. Or why don't I give you 1.2? You own the building free and clear. You've, you've taken the cost basis to zero because you've owned it for 40 years. Why don't we structure a note where you get a little bit of income today, I can hold the building forever because we're we're controlling the payment. And, you know, when you pass on the notes, you know, part of your estate well, and everybody wins. 
Yeah, listen, I mean, I, I, I can, I love this and I've done this before and I'll, and I'll tell you, there is a very, very effective way to do this, which is that you, you submit your offer, right? With a little grid that you make, a little chart that says like, you know, bank finance or whatever. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you know, seller financing, and then you can just say, okay, here's the price I can pay if I'm going to a bank, here's the price I can pay if you sell or finance it, right? Obviously it's going to be a bigger number. You know, how much money are you going to get right now? X and Y, you can show probably a bigger number, right? Absolutely. Then additional payments, right? How much more, you know, and then you say, you know, additional stream of income to you under bank finance, zero under exactly. seller finance. It's like, you know, X a year, whatever it is, 50,000 a year. Right. And then, and then total value of the deal to yeah. you. Well, and and then you can also put it and I put in stuff too, which is like stuff like, you know, chance of the deal getting falling apart because of the lender, you know, yeah. seller with lender financing, you know, 50, 50 not, or the, yeah, not zero, second, right? take, there's a check, yeah. you know, check mark. Yes, it's possible. Right. Yeah. Seller financing zero, zero risk. And so mm-hmm. those things, when you, when you actually put them side by side and make it so that the, that the seller can really put it in context and understand how it benefits them to do seller financing deal, that can yeah. be really compelling to the and right in, person. In these big deals, the other, I'm sure, I'm sure it's in your grid, but I just want the audience to see it. I would also put down the tax hit. Yeah. Right. You're you're gonna you sell this building for cash. Let's just again say eight hundred grand, and let's say you bought it forty years ago for, I don't know, a hundred grand. You have seven hundred thousand dollars in capital gains. You also have depreciation. You know, I don't know what the building is. Call it eighty grand. You're, you're gonna it's just right. you're gonna have depreciation recapture. You're gonna have I I mean, your tax liability day one is gonna be a big freaking number, and right. it could be much much smaller. If you do seller financing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, this gets into some obscure tax stuff that I don't quite understand, but it, you know, it's like a deferred sale, you know, and, and so it's an installment sale. It's treated very differently. And so they're not paying that whole capital gains, not all at once, right there. They can defer that. So yeah, yeah, the only, the only tax they will pay is on, in like, if you bought it for 1.2, hundred grand down, that would be taxable. Yeah. And then that would be a percentage of the sale. And then it's the interest. Uh, on yep. the loan and then the principal pay down if there is any, right? I would probably do interest only just to keep it clean. But yeah, it's, I want people to know I'm willing to overpay in this cycle. And there's going to be plenty of sellers that are like, there's not a lot of buyers. It's harder to get financing. You know, we're, I'm willing to work out deals where the seller wins and I win. And, and you're right. The reason we can do this is because my hold period, I'm yep. looking a lot longer than two to five years, right? I'd love to buy yep. these buildings and own them until I'm a hundred. And yeah. there we go. So, and it really depends on your, on, on your perspective, right? Because if you're, you know, if you were buying for yourself and you're like 6% return is, is what you want, then like you can pay that, right? You yeah. can pay, you can pay that level. Whereas if you're, you know, doing a syndication and you're like, wow, I really got to figure out how to get, you know, close to 20% annualized return that really right. affects like how much you can pay. So yeah. Um, it, it, if you are buying for yourself, then you have, a, I, I mean, I like this because it, you just have a lot more flexibility in this than you do with a syndicated deal, you know, where you have to return capital. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great strategy and especially if, you know, you're able to find just really well-located property, you know, just like, I mean, that's really what it's all about, right? If you find a really well-located property that's really good, you know, positioning for a long-term hold, then yeah, it's not that extra hundred thousand dollars that you pay, especially if you can finance the debt so that it's that the yeah. property can easily afford to bear the debt, then exactly you're in great shape. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think this is a lot of power coming uh, with this. I've done this in the past. And again, I what we're talking about here, folks, doesn't have to be a commercial building. It could be a house. Oh yeah. Right. It, it does. I mean, this this concept of overpaying um, and having that conversation with the seller, you obviously have to find a seller that can say yes, right? You're not going to, this deal won't work for somebody who bought the house yesterday, right? There's yeah. no equity there. But again, it's a strategy. There will be people looking to sell. 
there would be p- people looking to sell where the asset is not in great shape. It won't appraise. The buyers are just, a, you know, and the other thing we've talked about this, right? It's going to become harder to raise capital. Yeah. And thus the prices on commercial are going to come down because the buyer pool, they just can't pay as much. It's and, already happened. It's already yeah. happened. So I'll overpay folks. If you got a California multifamily property, let's talk. Uh, you know, again, mm-hmm. we've got to do the deal right. But yeah, it's, there's there's a lot there. I want to switch gears a little bit and yeah. talk about your boutique hotels. So again, you, I think you're in two of them now. Yeah. Uh, how, how's, you know, let's reframe for people that may not know. What did you identify or find and then just execute? What, what's going on in boutique hotels uh, that there's a lot of value add that's possible? Yeah. So so this is this is my thesis on these these hotels. There is a whole generational shift going on right now where, you know, a a lot of people came into this, this business, this sort of mom and pop hotel motel business in 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, right? Mm -hmm. And they ran these things as family businesses. And now those people all need to retire or, you know, maybe they've, passed on and their children have now inherited these hotels either way all the family's wealth is locked up in these assets and they're very hard to sell at the moment right and and usually the kids don't want them because the kids have moved on right the kids are not in the hotel business right uh they they want to they've done something else with their lives they don't want to run these assets so uh it they can't be passed on they need to be sold Mm -hmm. and there's a the other thing about the way that these businesses work is you know, these mom and pops, they they really don't reinvest in their properties, right? Or maybe they did back. You know, yeah, we, they we've did seen in the, the beginning, pat- but not the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see this pattern where they they're, they seem to have been renovated in the 1990s mm. and then not renovated since then. And mm. um, so the properties, even if they're well maintained, they're just outdated. They need to be upgraded. They need to be modernized. And there's a limited number of people who have the skill set to go and buy these assets, raise the capital and, and, and put in the additional CapEx that's really needed, right? Once that's all done, then there's a much bigger buyer pool of people who want to run it, you know, want to buy an asset that's already done, right? And stabilized. But Mm -hmm. when they're not stabilized, when they're, when they need CapEx, there are very few lenders who want to lend on this. Mostly these are, you know, you're looking at bridge debt. It's very expensive. Very expensive. Especially now, short term, very expensive. Short term, short term yeah. bridge debt. I mean, yes. and the bridge debt, which used to all be non-recourse. Now that lenders are asking for personal recourse, Ooh. right? It's like, it's, it's a very different lending environment, which means that any hotels that are on the market now that are in that condition are going to be very, very hard uh, to sell. So that means on the buyer side, opportunity galore for Amen. these assets and that's that's what i really like about this and that seller financing pitch is very appealing right now because you can say to the seller look mr seller frankly this is the only way to do this deal yeah. either that or give me a big discount on it because yeah. and, and i'll buy it for cash uh, because nobody who needs financing is it just doesn't make sense with the price you're asking and uh and nobody's really lending on these things right now so if you need to sell or want to sell, this is the option that you have. And, uh, and you know, what's going to happen is either the sellers are going to recognize that that's, that's the option, or they're going to go sit on the market for a while and eventually come back when they realize that that's the, the only option, right? So this is a good opportunity for you to buy. And whether you want to buy this these assets to run as a hotel or to convert them into apartments, either way, you know, this works. And I'm definitely looking for opportunities like that, too. Uh, where we can take some of these older assets, maybe they're not kind of what we want for a hotel, but they're maybe they're too small, or maybe their the location isn't as good, or what have you. But if there's demand in the market for apartments, then we'd be happy to to convert them into apartments, and then stabilize them, and then sell them to a local apartment investor. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity coming. I think I think this this recession. Is, is you know for the folks who are getting prepared that are having a thesis, you're going to really have a combination of things come together, right? Uh, um, we've already talked about the stressed lending environment opening up, up opportunities for seller financing. We also have generation changes, right? Yeah. It's it's not 
you know, it's not a surprise to anybody that baby boomers uh, have more wealth than any other generation. And oh, by the way, they're getting older every day. Yep. And like you said, it, it's um, the ki their kids and maybe even their grandkids want nothing to do with the hotel or the multifamily. Yeah. And there's really a couple options. You either sell it now when you're alive and get something, or you know what will happen. You're going to pass on. They're going to come to your funeral and, and the next day they're going to list and fire sell the asset. You know, what do you want to do? I think there's a lot of stuff coming. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think especially if, for these hotels and motels, uh, you know, this is an operating business, right? So the kids really don't want them because they, they've got to be there every day and run these hotels and you don't really get a vacation from this business, unlike multifamily, right? But even for multifamily, I mean, a lot of these things were sort of mom and pop operated. They might be too small for professional management, right? And they, and they, and they so if you're local and you are able to go and run these yourselves and, you know, collect the rents and set up a system to operate the property, uh, it's going to be a good opportunity for you to pick some of these assets up from, you know, these families who essentially just want the cash, right? I mean, they, they really, they want the cash rather than the They, they want to reduce their headache and they want to look, be liquid. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's really going to be interesting. And the other thing I want to talk about is kind of the timeline for when these assets might show up. Again, I have a thesis I'll share with you and let me know where I'm, where I might be off. In the last cycle, at least what I saw in Fresno, California, there's, I, there's a building I bought. So I'll talk about that one. There was an 18 unit building. It was listed for 1.44 uh, for seemingly years. Ultimately, what happens is the building gets foreclosed on. And what I found out later is the original buyer who had it at 1.44 had a seller financing note of about 1.2. Yeah. But the market turned. He couldn't pay it. The building went into repair, was half vacant. It was just an ugly situation. So ultimately, uh, the note holder foreclosed and took it back, which I'm sure wasn't a fun process. Yeah. Then he, he reached out to me because I own something else on the street. And we had a conversation and we ended up picking that up for, for 700 grand. So half, half what it was listed for. So this is my thesis. And again, I go back to my conversation with that local community bank that says, Hey, you're good, but look at my file. I, I can't refi yeah. half these. So I'm thinking a lot of these properties will be listed at what I'll call wish pricing. Yeah in the MLS or Crexy or LoopNet or all of them or whatever, probably for at least six months, if not a year. And then at some point, the lender is going to go enough already and start a foreclosure. Is that, because again, I, I want people to realize these assets will be listed in the public. They'll right. be listed at stupid prices. It's not like, it's not like they're just going to show up on the, you know, the courthouse step one day They're, the the right. owner is going to try to sell because the bank won't foreclose. They'll give them six months or a year notice. There, there will be some timeline. Don't you think? Yeah, I do think so. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, when you're seeing these multifamily foreclosures that are happening right now in the news, it's not like they were delinquent once and, and then the bank. Oh, foreclosed, yeah. Right. Exactly. Like they've been delinquent for a few months. And, the, and they've been that whole time they've been talking with the bank about trying to restructure or you know figure out a way to avoid foreclosure and it's only because the, the those discussions didn't work that the foreclosure has happened so yeah I, I agree that you should look at you know follow the listings in your area and and just tr track deals that you find interesting and see how long they sit there on the market right yeah. if they've been sitting there for a while, I mean, there's only one or two things that could be going on. One is, well, the, the seller doesn't need to sell, but they're just hoping to get a crazy price. And that's probably some small percentage. Yeah. So, you know, somebody there. hoping for a 1031 or whatever. They're, they're Like, you give me my number, I'm good. Otherwise, I'll keep it. There's there's some of yeah, that. Yeah, there's some of that. But most yeah. of those people are list, they're listed because they want to sell. Right? right. And so, and the longer it goes, the more desperate they're going to get, the more open they're going to be to a reasonable offer. Right. And and so, you know, you should be looking at that stuff. Tag and listen, uh, I, the second hotel deal I got, I only got it because I had favorited it, even though it was under contract when I saw it. Mm -hmm. And just because I like the asset, I was like, this is the kind of thing I'm looking for. I want to remember, you know, this, right. this deal. 
And then I got a notification when it fell out of contract hmm. and, and called the broker that day, you know? Yeah. So you, you want to don't give up on properties that you see, uh, you know, that are in contract because that yeah, I agree. Listen, a couple of hotels I've been following have been in and out of contract several times already. So, you know, yeah. Stay on top of that. I, I love it. At the end of the day, folks, this conversation was how to get rich during a recession. Lots of opportunity. You could put, th you know, different strategies together, network, start doing the work, evaluate deals. Just, you got to get in the game. You got to get yeah. in the game. Jonathan, you have an amazing Facebook group. Where should we send them? Uh, to follow and, and get some uh, get some ideas. Yeah, well, uh, come to Apartment Investors Club uh, on Facebook, but um, also I'm sort of increasingly shifting my attention to LinkedIn. Okay. So um, please follow that me on LinkedIn sense. and connect with me there. Um, and, uh, you know, you can always also come to my website, apartmentinvestorsclub.com, grab the free download that's there, uh, get on my investor list. So there's lots of different ways to connect. Makes total sense that you would focus on LinkedIn. It's a much more cultivated experience. There's where... Um, you know, folks, it, it makes a lot of sense that that's where you focus versus the craziness of Facebook. So it makes total yeah, sense. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, Facebook, you know, we're, we're kind of wrapping this up, but Facebook has changed a lot in recent years. It's not as good a, a medium for conversation as it used to be. And it also seems like the demise of Twitter, ha like a lot of people have moved over to LinkedIn. So there's a lot yeah. of good discussion yeah. happening on LinkedIn at a very high level. So I, 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 I used to not like LinkedIn, but I like it a lot now. Very cool. I will check it out. That's 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 the one social media app I had before I quit. And I got to tell you, I never went back once I was out. I was like, that's only when I'm working and I'm not working anymore. But I should check yeah, it out. That, You're right. That's where the conversations are happening now. So you should go Very check cool. it out. All right, buddy. Take care of yourself. Have a wonderful week. All right. You too, Mike. See you later. Thank you.